Hello friends, this is Jim with Science Talk. I have a couple of stories uh, involving space for you. Uh, the first one deals with uh, black holes. And this one says, monster black holes near the center of our Milky Way galaxy may have transformed many Neptune exoplanets into rocky super-Earths. This is the findings of some new research that has just come out. It is thought that uh, black holes, supermassive black holes, but black holes are uh, uh, believed, thought to reside or be found at the center of most, if not all, uh, large galaxies. Black holes, because of their strong gravitational uh, field, tend to pull in just about any matter that's close by. And, and so, uh, ingesting, if you can use that word, uh, the matter, they generate uh, large flares of X-ray and UV, ultraviolet, radiation. New findings suggest that these powerful bursts could strip nearby exoplanets of their thick, gaseous atmospheres, leaving behind bare, rocky core surface. These rocky bodies would likely be heavier than Earth, making them so-called super-Earths. This is from a statement from the uh, Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. The lead uh, study, uh, Professor Howard Chen, who is a researcher at the Northwestern University Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, said that it's pretty wild to think of black holes shaping the evolutionary destiny of a planet, but that very well may be the case in the center of our galaxy. In the study at hand, the researchers examined the environment surrounding Sagittarius A, which is a the four million solar mass supermassive black hole that lurks in the center of our galaxy, which is about 25,000 light years from Earth. Specifically, the researchers studied the effect that the high energy radiation from Sagittarius A has on exoplanets that are located less than 70 light years from the black hole and have masses somewhere between Earth's and Neptune's. And as I mentioned before, these planets are called super-Earth because they're bigger than our rocky oceanic Earth or many Neptunes because they're smaller than the cold gas shrouded Neptune that is in our own solar system. The super-Earths are actually quite common that, have, that astronomers have discovered outside our solar system. So says co-author Avi Loeb of these... Uh, and he says that our work shows that in the right environment, they might form in uh, interesting ways. In fact, the recent findings suggest that this process may be the most common way in which rocky super-Earths form near the center of the Milky Way. Some of the hypotheses uh, put forth for these formations. It is possible some of these planets may be found in the habitable zone of a star where temperatures are just right for liquid water to uh, pers persist and be found, and perhaps, if you have liquid water, perhaps life can be found, be it single cellular or multicellular. However, in the galactic center, it's very challenging for life to develop and persist in the first place due to uh, severe radiation, supernovas going off, exploding, and so on, high energy gamma rays, and other sorts of violent outbursts that take place. If there's a passing star, passing star could cause gravitational disruptions that could tear the planet away from its uh, life-sustaining host star. This is uh, addressing why life is difficult to be found there. Such disruptions may be more common in areas packed with stars such as Sagittarius A. It is generally accepted that the innermost region of the Milky Way is not favorable for life, Loeb said. But even though the deck seems stacked against life in this region, the likelihood of panspermia, where life is transmitted via interplanetary or interstellar contact, would be much more common in such a dense environment. This process might give life 
an, an ability to arise and survive. Detecting exoplanets near the core of the Milky Way is challenging due to the distance from Earth, abundance of stars, thick clouds of dust, gas, and so forth that can block light. However, larger next-generation ground-based telescopes such as the European Extremely Large Telescope could help to overcome these difficulties by looking for transits in which an exoplanet orbits in front of its star. Another method that could pr prove useful for detecting such exoplanets involves searching for stars with traces of unusual elements in their atmosphere that could indicate that the star has migrated away from the center of the galaxy. Now usually what they're talking about uh, looking at uh, trace elements in their atmosphere, they're looking at, they're doing a spectral analysis. You can, uh, light can be absorbed, or elements will absorb light, specific wavelengths. And so when you see uh, a, a very narrow band of light, uh, whatever, this, of the, whatever frequency of the electromagnetic spectrum, that is typically indicative of uh, an element or of a compound. So by looking at the spectral signature, uh, astronomers, astrophysicists can uh, determine what elements, what gases, what compounds are present. So it's a useful tool and uh, that is often used in their in analyses looking at exoplanets and stars. Uh, this study has been published in the February 22nd issue of Astrophysical Journal Letters if you wish to learn more of it. The next story involves radiation. Deep space, deep, deep space, excuse me, deep space radiation may be getting more dangerous for future astronauts. Space radiation may be a bigger worry for voyaging astronauts than scientists had previously thought, at least in the near future, a new study suggests. Nathan Schwadron, a professor of physics at the University of New Hampshire Space Science Center, said the radiation dose rates from measurements obtained over the last four years exceeded trends from previous solar cycles by at least 30%, indicating that the radiation environment is getting far more intense. And Professor Schwadron is also the lead author and lead scientist. He goes on to state, these particle radiation conditions present important environmental factors for space travel and space weather and must be carefully studied and accounted for in the planning and design of future missions to the moon, Mars, asteroid, and beyond. Schwadron and his colleagues studied observations made by NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO, which has been circling the moon since 2009. Specifically, they looked at dose rates of galactic cosmic rays measured over the past four years by LRO's Cosmic Ray Telescope for the effects of radiation, which has the lovely acronym CRATER. And by the way, cosmic radiation are basically parts of atoms. It could be protons, it could be neutrons, you know, fragments of uh, atoms, and so forth. Uh, that hits our atmosphere or, or basically impacts whatever's in their way. Galactic cosmic rays are super energetic particles, mostly protons and atomic nuclei, the fragments of them really, that have been accelerated to tremendous speeds by distance and dramatic events such as supernova explosions. Galactic cosmic rays can do damage to spacecraft, electronics, and in large enough doses can cause radiation sickness in astronauts or longer term problems due to overexposure and prolonged overexposure, such as cancer. We know that radiation is, uh, is a, carcin is a uh, cancer causing uh, factor. And of course, uh, radiation, uh, be it uh, cosmic rays or when the sun has uh, a coronal mass eruption can also create problems for uh, satellites 
with the electronics on board uh, those devices in orbit. The rise in uh, galactic cosmic ray levels is related to a prolonged stretch of low solar activity which ebbs and flows on an approximately 11 year cycle. During active phases, the sun's magnetic field spreads throughout the solar system more extensively by the flow of charged particles known as the solar wind and it deflects more incoming cosmic rays. So in other words, when solar activity is increased, the magnetic field uh, is spread further out and it actually serves a protective function. It keeps cosmic rays at bay. When solar activity is reduced, such as we, what we have currently ongoing, the magnetic field from the sun doesn't ex extend as far, does not offer the protection from cosmic rays, hence increasing uh, the risk and vulnerability of uh, issues to uh, electronics, hu uh, humans, and so forth. But of course, just because we have an active sun, extending its magnetic field isn't all that gravy because solar flares, coronal mass ejections, mass eruptions, which are powerful blasts, can send huge clouds of superheated plasma at many millions of uh, miles per hour, and that can also cause radiation levels to increase significantly. So it's kind of a give and take on this one here. This study has just been accepted for publication and will appear shortly in the journal Space Weather. Now I wanted to bring uh, those two quick stories from space. If you like the video, if you'd like to hear more about such news, uh, please share, please uh, tell me if you want to see more stories of this nature. If you like, please share the video. Please subscribe, hit the bell so you know when a video is uploaded. Uh, please tell your friends about my channel. If, uh, if you wish, you can go to patreon.com forward slash science talk with Jim Massa and become a patron. Subscribe to my work for a very nominal monthly fee. If you are already a, a patron at Patreon, I thank you for your continued support.